Well, good morning to you. And as we were just singing about receiving God's love, man, my heart for you today is that uh, today wouldn't just be an opportunity for you to just hear some information, but for you to actually receive from God his love that he has for you. That this, this wouldn't just be a transaction, but this would be an actual experience for you with a living God who I believe wants to speak to you today. And that's what I've been praying for for you today. And so we are going to jump into his word. But first, I, I, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm somebody who loves that freshly manicured lawn where it's just like perfect, lush, green grass. There's, there's uh, no weeds or anything within it. I hate dandelions. Roundup is basically my best friend, especially now that we're in spring now that we're here in the middle of May and have finally come out of the winter, <laughs> praise the Lord. I know you're amening right now. <laughs> but uh, we're going to read a passage today where it seems like uh, we're supposed to actually save the weeds. And that's actually what we're going to call our talk for today is save the weeds. And maybe you're wondering, like me, why does Jesus want to save the weeds? Well, we are going to jump into his word and dive into that and talk about that together. It's found in Matthew chapter 13. It's going to pop up on your screen here. This is called the parable of the weeds found in Matthew 13 verse 24. Here's what it says. Jesus told them another parable, which is a story. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then, gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. I just want to pause here and let you know Jesus tells another parable. And the disciples honestly heard that, and they were, quite frankly, confused. And I don't know about you, but there's times for me where I will hear something in Scripture, and I'm not sure what it means. And what I love about God is that he allows us to ask him questions at any time. And here is what uh, it says, the parable of the weeds explained in verse 36. Then he, Jesus, left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Can you explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field? Jesus answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember back in the middle school days, we had the in crowd and the out crowd. And I had uh, some real big, colorful braces with some big, thick glasses. So you know I was in the in crowd. I, I know you already suspected that. <laughs> but the, the truth is about the, the uh, you know, what is, what is popularity in middle school, the in and out crowd, there, this translates into adulthood as well, where we oftentimes have, and it's not just in the world, it's in the church as well, who is in and who is out, who, who actually uh, is, is in the kingdom of God and who is not. And, and here's the thing is, sometimes we do this, and I think it's subconsciously, but we start to separate ourselves. What Jesus is saying are the weeds 
and the wheat. And Jesus is telling us very clearly and very specifically today, that is not our job. It is not our job or our role. Instead, the wheat and the weeds in this time are to grow together. And so what this means is that the good, the bad, the righteous, the unrighteous, we are supposed to be growing together. And, you know, it seems like when you're around church people or you're at church, it seems like there's some people who just really seem to have it all together. And there's other people who seem to just be struggling spiritually all the time. And what Jesus is here to say to us today is that we actually need each other. It's actually better that we would be growing together. And, you know, our suspicion, we can think, well, if we just got all the good, the, 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 the good people, the holy people, the, the best of the best together, then, man, this thing could really grow so much better. Like, we wouldn't have these weeds or these people who can tear us down. Like, these people do all of these terrible sins and all these. And Jesus is just clearly here to say today, it is not your job and it is not my job to figure out who is the weeds and who is the wheat or for us to determine who is in and who is out. Because here's the thing of who God is. God is somebody who is relentless with grace. God is somebody who will not close doors on people. He wants to open the door to everyone, that everyone might hear who he is. And what's so interesting in this parable is that the weeds and the wheat, they look so much the same. Like, when they're starting to grow out of the ground in this time, in this harvest, like, they can't tell. It's not like in in your bed uh, when you've got your flowers, you've got these really prickly things. You can tell that's clearly a weed. I can pull that out. No, the way these would grow is they would grow really closely together, and you couldn't really tell them apart. That's true for us today as the weeds and the wheat, is that it's, it's really hard to tell what's really going on inside of somebody else's heart. Like, we, we can't know what's truly going on in somebody else's heart or mind. And so Jesus is saying today, it is not our job to judge somebody else's journey. Because we have to know that even though we can't see beneath the surface, God always can. God can see your heart. And he knows of your mistakes and he knows of your shortfalls, but God still loves you. And God is still inviting you today to follow after him. You know, I think of even back to the time when uh, Jesus was roaming the earth and the people who most people would have thought were the wheat in that time. It would have been the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders, the people who looked like they had it all together. But the truth is, we see in scripture that Jesus treats them the harshest of anybody. In fact, he goes into the temple because they are not worshiping the one true God. He's flipping tables. Like, that's where we see Jesus the most upset, is with the people who actually looked like on the surface they had it all together, but inside of their hearts, they didn't. Man, we can't know what God is doing right now in somebody else's heart, and so it is not for us to judge, and we don't know what God is about to do in somebody else's heart or life. So for us, We can't be the ones who are trying to determine who is in and who is out. It's not our job. It was never meant to be. I remember uh, about 10 years ago, I had just started here at Calvary. I was a nice young buck, shaggy hair. (laughs) Oh, man. Again, just looking amazing, just like those middle school years. And uh, I remember I was, uh, back then I was our youth and worship leader. So I was about to start our service and start uh, singing some praise songs to God. And as I'm walking from the back of the auditorium, which that auditorium is now all shaken up, and uh, we're doing all sorts of construction, and booyah, can't wait for that thing to get going and get done. I'm so excited that we've got progress there. But I was walking back in its uh, old form and our old auditorium space, and a person stops me, and he says, uh, he says, hey, Jonathan, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, actually, I, you know, I'm just about to start service. I, I got to go right now, um, so, but I can connect with you later. And he said, well, before you go, I just want to tell you that every time that you think that you're leading worship, 
what you're actually doing is quenching the spirit. I just kind of looked at him confused. Now, I'm, I'm somebody who has grown up in church. My dad's a pastor. I know pretty much all of the Christian lingo, but I had never heard this one before. But me and all my context clues thought spirit, that's God, that is good, that is who I'm trying to connect to. And quenching means stop. <laughs> so stopping people from connecting with God, that would be the opposite of what I was trying to do. Um, but now I was being told that that is how I was leading other people. So I was kind of stunned and I, I was honestly confused. I was trying to process even what it meant. Uh, but I said, hey, let's connect later. And, and we did. But I went up on stage and I started the service. And all of a sudden, for me, it was no longer about how could I help this room of people connect with a living God who wants to tell them great news today and people who want to sing of his praises and sing of his faithfulness and his goodness and his love and his mercy. I wasn't thinking about any of those things. Now I was just thinking about me. I became so self-conscious. And so I'm singing my song and I'm like, oh, I, I hope I don't hit a wrong note. And then I'm hearing somebody in the band playing wrong notes. And all I'm thinking about is, oh, I wonder what all these people are thinking about that person now playing the wrong notes. And, and, now, and for seemingly the whole worship set, it had nothing to do with me trying to connect with God or me trying to help others. It was just about what was going on in, of what other people, how they were perceiving me. And man... I got to tell you, what happened next was that it, I walked off stage, and instead of just processing it and trying to say, hey, was there anything that was true within what was said here? Is there any ways I could improve? Or maybe this is just a person who is hurting, or any of those things. And I, I thought some of those things, but I actually moved it to a place where I started actually judging him back. And this is a person I didn't really know that well. He didn't know me. I didn't really know him. I'd only been at church for a couple of weeks. We'd had a couple surface level interactions. And I started saying, you know what, though? I've heard about him. I've heard that he puts himself above other people. I've heard that he uses his words to tear other people down. And instead of just processing it and saying, okay, I need to find any sort of truth here and grow from it and discard what isn't there, instead, I started judging him. And I started labeling him as a modern-day Pharisee. And I started, and you know what happened? I started putting up walls between me and him instead of building a bridge and trying to build a connection and trying to see what God wanted to do through this, this interaction and through this now conflict for me. I turned it into judgment in my own heart. And here's what happens for us is judgment can it, it just hurts, number one. If you've ever been judged, it hurts. But judgment can also just kill our confidence when we do this to other people. It kills their confidence. And judgment can close doors that God never intended to close for other people. I think that judging someone else's spiritual walk is one of the most hurtful things we could ever do to somebody else. I think this is why God is saying, it's not our job to judge. I mean, Jesus came with this message over and over in the Gospels. Do not judge. Now, I do have to give a, a caveat and, and a word of caution today. Because the way that the, the phrase, do not judge others, gets used sometimes in our culture can get misconstrued. So I want to break this down for you. Because I think that sometimes what can be viewed as judgment is actually a challenge. So the, the Bible actually encourages us to challenge one another. It, it, the, the way the Bible describes it is to spur one another on towards the good works that God has for you. Well, part of spurring on is encouragement. It has to be there. But part of what's spurring on sometimes is calling somebody up and, or even calling somebody out in our brothers and sisters who follow after Christ. And here's the thing is, there's a difference between challenge and judgment. And we have to get this right as a church. Judgment, challenge is where I am for you. I am for you and I'm trying to lift you up. Judgment is I'm elevating myself above you. And now I'm looking down on you. 
And there's a key and clear distinction that happens in our own heart. And it's also true that people can, you can be trying to challenge somebody and you have a heart that's for them and they can receive that as judgment. All, all of that can happen. But the truth is, if, if we as a church, we can't be a church who doesn't ever challenge each other, but we also are being called today very clearly from God's word not to judge other people and their walk and where they are at with God. So where are the places and the spaces for you that you're most prone to judge other people? I've been thinking about that a lot this week as I've been processing this passage. Maybe for you, it's, it's those horrible sinners, those people who do just detestable things. And, or, or maybe it's like, I would never do what that person has done or how they live their lifestyle. And here's what I would tell you today. Uh, be really, really careful. The moment you say, I would never do that, is the moment you are most susceptible for a fall. And here's the thing. I, I think we've got to watch that when that is coming up in our hearts and in our minds. We, we cannot be a people who says, I would never do that. And then, okay, now we start to elevate ourselves above somebody else. And that's not what God has called us to today. You know, the thing about judgment is that judgment is not usually overt. It's usually covert in our lives. Meaning, it's, it's not like you wake up in the morning like, oh, yeah, I'm going to judge some people today. Or like, yeah, I'm going to judge that person. No. It happens subtly in our heart. And sometimes it comes out of our mouth, but often, oftentimes it does just happen inside of our heads. But guess what? That judgment that happens inside of our minds still affects how we think about and how we interact with other people. It just does. And so instead it puts distance between us because now, again, we're elevating ourselves. Jesus is calling us, the weeds and the wheat, to grow together for this time. That's what he says. Now, this passage also gets to some really, honestly, uncomfortable language for many of us uh, as followers of Jesus, where uh, you know, it, he starts to talk about how at the end of the age, at the end of time, basically, the weeds and the wheat are going to be separated. And uh, he starts using some very descriptive language of what that could look like. And, you know, I think it raises one of the biggest questions we can ask as followers of Jesus. And that is, how could a loving God send somebody to hell? And why would he do that? Well, I think I'd, I'd love to, for you to process that yourself and, and think about that. But I think that this scripture passage itself, right where it ends, has something really interesting about the heart of God. It says this, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Whoever has ears, let them hear. It's exactly what God says. And so what does that mean? Well, you have to know about the heart of God. The heart of God is that no one ever would be separated from him. That's who God is. He loves every single one of his creation so much. You have to realize, if, if he really is a perfect loving father, a perfect loving father never wants to be separated forever from their children. That's not what a perfect loving father is. That's not the heart of God. We even look in scripture. Here is what it says in 1 Timothy 2.4. God our Savior wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3.9 says it again. God does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So to answer this question, how could a loving God send someone to hell? You first have to know the heart of God, and that is that no one ever would be separated from him. That's his heart. But at the end of the day, God gives us a choice. He gives you a choice today. Whether you want to accept his love, the Bible says God loved you first. But now for us, we get to decide, how am I going to respond to that love? And the thing of it is, God respects that choice. God respects whatever direction you want to go in your life. Whatever you want to make the Lord of your life, you're allowed to do. You're allowed to freely choose that. 
I remember for my own self and my own heart, in my high school days, I was on my own journey and trying to figure out what, what was I going to follow? What was I going to give my life to? And initially, it was basically two things. It was funny and money, <laughs> and they rhyme. I, you know, I wanted to have a good time, and I wanted to have a really good job that would pay the bills, that would provide for my family. Even, even those young years, I was thinking about that. Like, it was, it was about pleasure and finances. Those are the things I was after. And you know what? I realized that Jesus really was who he said he was. He was the savior of the world and that he loved me. And when I realized that not only was it good news, but it was true news, I decided I'm going to give my life to Christ. And everything in my life from that time has changed. My entire trajectory, both now and forever. And here's the thing. He wants to do that exact same thing for you today. He is inviting you to make him Lord of your life. And the truth of who God is, is God is 100% love. But you got to hear this too. Hear this with me, church. God is also 100% justice. You have to know there is going to be one day where God says, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough with these injustices. Enough with people being shot just for the color of their skin. We cannot have that anymore. God will say, enough. Enough with diseases. Enough with the coronavirus. Enough with robbing so many lives for destroying jobs, economy. Enough with all of that. Enough with our mental health issues that, that plague so many of us on a regular day. God is going to say enough. God is going to say enough to death itself. Eradicated forever. And that is the point where the wheat and the weeds will be separated. And today, Jesus is inviting us. To, he's inviting you. He wants to save the weeds. He wants to save each and every one of us. His heart bleeds for you. His heart longs for you. And that is why at the end of time, he's going to make all things right. And pff, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. But I do know this, one day, every tear is going to be wiped from your eye. Every, every pain that you have experienced, he is going to make right. That is who God is. And so today, we're invited with two challenges, two reflections that I want you to think about. The first is this. Where are the places and the spaces in your heart where you have spiritually elevated yourself above other people? Or where are you most prone to do this? With what people does that happen? Where does judgment and those, those roots take place in your own heart? I want to invite you to think about that for a moment. And the second thing is maybe today God is stirring in your heart and you want to decide to follow after him. I promise you, it's not the easiest journey. It's not always the smoothest path. It gets bumpy. But I will tell you, it is the best decision you could ever make in your life. And it starts with a prayer. It doesn't end there, but it starts with you just acknowledging and saying, God, I want to give my life to you. So I'm going to give you an invitation right now to be able to pray this with me, right on your screen, right wherever you are encountering this right now. Would you pray this with me? There's nothing magical to this. It's just a moment for you to say yes to Jesus. God, I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, for me. I desire to give my whole heart to you, to place you as the number one authority in my life. I believe in your death and your resurrection. I believe in your love and your justice. And today, I choose to follow you. Amen. Amen. No matter where you're at on your journey, 
we are here with you. And maybe we can't meet face to face right now, but that doesn't mean that we can't interact and that we can't continue to grow. We are going to continue to take spiritual ground in this time as a church. And so maybe for you, you would like to start a conversation. I'm going to give you a phone number. You can text me right now or later, whenever. I want you to start a conversation if you would like. Maybe for today, you have some things that you're struggling with of how you've been judging others and you just want to process that. Text me. Or maybe for you, you've made a decision or, or you have questions about making a decision to follow Jesus. Text me. Let's talk. Let's dialogue. I'm not going to force you to believe anything. I, I want to start a conversation with you about a God who loves you. So we are going to take this time now to... to Put these truths deep into our heart, and we're going to respond in song. And so wherever you are, I would just invite you, would you sing, Jesus, may you be the king of my heart.